Colossians chapters 1 through 4 will be what we'll consider during this presentation and what Paul taught the Colossian saints and how it applies to us. First of all, a little introduction. Since Paul stated he was a prisoner during the time he wrote Colossians, the epistle may date from between AD 60 and 62 while he was in prison in Rome. Paul most likely wrote the epistle to the Colossians around the same time he wrote Philippians, Philemon, and Ephesians. All these epistles bear similarities to one another. This epistle was written to the faithful saints in Colossia, a site in modern-day Turkey. Paul instructed the Colossian saints to share the letter with the members of the church in nearby Laodicea. Details in the epistle to the Colossians suggest that, this, that in the region of Colossia, heretical, heretical beliefs and worship practices had developed blending Christian, Jewish, and pagan ideas. These heresies minimized or denied the divine role of Jesus Christ. Such false ideas threatened the church but had not yet won over the many Colossian saints who remained faithful brethren in Christ. In writing this epistle, Paul hoped to communicate his personal concern for the saints, to counter out the false teachings and practices that threatened their faith, to testify the divinity and preeminence of Christ, and to exhort the saints to deepen their conversion to the Savior. These church members were faced with the unusual Jewish concept about the law of Moses with all its performances and rites, but they also seem to have been subject to the idea that a great concourse of angels ministered between God and man. These angels were supposed to govern in mortal affairs and thereby become the recipients of that worship which is properly reserved for God only. Accordingly, with true apostolic zeal, Paul wrote to remind the Colossian saints that true worship centers in Christ and his Father, and that the Mosaic system has long since been replaced by the gospel. His statements, among others, that Christ is the firstborn, the creator, the head of the church, in whom the fullness of Godhead dwells, are inspired writings of supplurative quality. Some members or apostates were denying the physicalness of the Savior, just as some of the Colossians denied the idea of bodily resurrection. The basic issue was whether Jesus was God or man, monotheistism or Arianism, or both at the same time. Some argued that Christ had one mind, Apollo one. Apollonarianism, or one will, monotheism, or that he was born a man and became a god, Nestorianism. Where there were two Christians, there were three opinions. Some were also attempting to displace the preeminent head with me me mediating angels. So you can see in Colossia that the great apostasy is taking a great hold, and you're getting all kinds of false ideas entering the church. In this epistle in the Coloss to the Colossians, Paul countered the heretical teachings in Colossia by emphasizing the preeminence of Jesus Christ. He presented an especially complete picture of the divinity and saving mission of Jesus Christ. He taught that Christ is, the very is in the very image of God the Father, an embodied, mem an embodied member of the Godhead, the Creator, the Head of the Church, the first to be resurrected, the Redeemer, and the hope of the Gospel which ye have heard. He is the Head of all principality and power, and He fulfills His divine mission under the direction of the Father. Paul warned against those who taught that true spirituality was gained through spiritual rituals, festivals, and diets. He taught that spiritual maturity and knowledge of God is not properly manifest through such customs and practices, but instead is manifested through setting our affections on the things which are above, eliminating unrighteous acts, and developing Christ-like attributes. Paul counseled his readers to become grounded and settled, as well as rooted and built up in Jesus Christ and established in the faith. 
Let's start with Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, separate beings. Following the pattern of his other epistles, in his opening greeting to the saints in Colossia, Paul referred to two separate and distinct beings in the Godhead, God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 4 through 12. Verse 4, faith in Christ. Faith in Christ consists of those laws obtained by God the Father, whereby progression and development come. Accordingly, every good thing in time and eternity grows out of and flows from the gospel. There is no blessing, no knowledge, no power, might, or dominion, no grace or good thing that will or can be withheld from those who live the gospel with faith in Christ. Temporarily, God's saints may lack health or wealth or power or influence or may desire and many desirable things, but eventually all things shall be theirs, for they are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Verse 5, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, phrase meaning, man is subject to the trials of mortality. If faithful, he receives the hope of eternal life. As used in the Revelations, hope is the desire of faithful people to gain eternal salvation in the kingdom of God hereafter. It is not flimsy, erethral desire, one without assurance that the desire consummation will be received, but a desire coupled with full expectation of receiving the coveted reward. Paul, for instance, was not hesitant in affirming that he lived in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. That was in Titus 1-2. And Peter assured all the elect that by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, their lively hope of an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for the saints, had been renewed or begotten again. 1 Peter 1, 1 through 5. So hope, again, is having a full expectations of the reward to be received. Hope is always centered in Christ. It always pertains to salvation in the kingdom of God. And without hope, there can be no salvation. Speaking to the Lord, Moroni, speaking to the Lord, the Moroni said, Thou hast prepared a house for man, yea, even among the mansions of thy father, in which man might have a more excellent hope. Wherefore, man must hope, or he cannot receive an inheritance in the place which thou hast prepared. Ether 12.32 Hope is born of righteousness. The hope of the righteous shall be gladness, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. Proverbs 10.28 the hope of the wicked shall be as the giving up of the ghost, Job 11.20. Hope is found through the gospel. The scriptures themselves have been recorded that men might have hope, Romans 15.4. And angels minister unto man to confirm that hope, Doctrine and Covenants 128.21. And those who gain the full hope of eternal life purify themselves even as Christ is pure. 1 John 3, 1-3 Faith and hope are inseparable. Hope enables men to have faith in the first instance, and then because of faith, that hope increases until salvation is gained. How is it that ye can attain unto faith, save ye shall have hope? Mormon asks. And what is it that ye shall hope for? Behold, I say unto you that ye shall hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto et life eternal, and this because of your faith in him according to the promise. Wherefore, if a man have faith, he must needs have hope, for without faith there cannot be any hope. And again, behold, I say unto you that he cannot have faith and hope, save his, he shall be meek and lowly in heart. If so, his faith and hope is vain, for none is acceptable before God save the meek and the lowly in heart. Romans 7, verses 40 through 44. Verse 6 of Colossians 1, In all generations, meaning in all dispensations, that is, the same gospel now preached by Paul and accepted by the Colossians, had been among the saints in past generations. Verse 7, 
who is a faithful minister of Christ, Christ on our behalf, meaning Paul the Apostle of the Gentiles could not himself visit Colossia. Ephra, Ephras had done this part of the work for him. Verse 8, love in the Spirit. Love is of God. It is shed forth by the light of Christ upon all mankind. But when it is perfected in the lives of righteous saints, it comes as a gift of the Spirit by the power of the Holy Ghost. Verse 9, filled with the knowledge of his will, meaning we can learn the mind and will of the Lord in general, in general sense of obedience to the basic laws of universal application, by reference to the recorded revelations which God has given. But we can only know the Lord's will where our specific and personal affairs are concerned by personal revelation, meaning you can't receive revelation for someone that's not under your stewardship going to receive it for you. Hence, when we conform to the divine will, calling for baptism and admission to the and, and admission to the kingdom of God on earth, we then receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and are entitled to continuing revelation. Then we can be filled with the knowledge of God's will concerning our personal affairs. Spiritual understanding in verse 9 meaning this is what sets the saints apart from the world. Others may equal or excel them in scientific knowledge, in philosophical comprehension, or any of the other things of the world, but only the saints of God do or can understand the things of God, for these come by revelation. For instance, only the saints understand the atonement, comprehend the doctrines of salvation, enjoy the gifts of the Spirit, receive spiritual rebirth, exercise faith unto life and salvation, and have a sure hope of eternal life. Verse 10, walk worthily unto the Lord, meaning remember who you are. Honor the name of Christ, which was placed upon you in the waters of baptism. As Mosiah 18.9 says, Yea, and are willing to mourn with those that mourn, yea, and comfort those that stand in need of comfort, and to stand as a witness of God at all times, in all things, and in all places that ye may be in, even until death, that ye may be redeemed of God, and be numbered with those of the first resurrection, that ye may have life, that ye may have eternal life. Verse 11, Patience and long suffering. Paul saying, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patient for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Verse 8, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Verse 9, Judge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Verse 10, take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Verse 11, behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Verse 12, the inheritance of the saints, meaning the kingdom of God on earth, which is the church, and the kingdom of of God in heaven, which is the celestial kingdom, hence peace in this life and eternal life in the world to come. Verse 13, God hath delivered us from the power of darkness, meaning he has delivered his saints from the world where spiritual darkness reigns. The world is in darkness. The saints are in the light. The whole world lieth in sin and groaneth under the darkness and under the bondage of sin. That was a quote from Doctrine and Covenants 84. 49. Colossians 1 14, redemption through his blood. False beliefs and forms of worship in the area of Colossia minimized their eternal role in divinity of Jesus Christ. The Colossians in, in Colossians 1 14, the Apostle Paul began an argument to support the superiority of Jesus Christ over all other things the Colossian saints might be tempted to worship. See verses 14 through 20. Paul began by stating that through the shedding of Christ's blood we can obtain forgiveness of sins. 
President Dallin H. Oaks pointed out, Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God, the Eternal Father. He is our Creator. He is our Teacher. He is our Savior. His atonement paid for the sin of Adam and won victory over death, assuring resurrection and immortality for all men. He is all of these, but He is more. Jesus Christ is the Savior whose atoning sacrifice opens the door for us to be cleansed of our personal sins so that we can be be readmitted to the presence of God. He is our Redeemer. End of quote. Colossians 1.15 The image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Paul said Jesus Christ is the image, meaning the likeness or manifestation of the invisible God. By describing God as invisible, Paul meant that he is unseen, not necessarily unseeable or incapable of being seen. The Apostle's point was that although God is presently unseen by our human eyes, Jesus Christ's appearance and character demonstrate what the Father is like. This is true of the Father's spiritual nature and his physical nature. As we learn through Latter-day Revelation and the Prophet Joseph Smith's eyewitness account of the Father's physical body. Paul also taught that Jesus Christ was the firstborn of every creature. Jesus was the firstborn of the spirit children of our Heavenly Father, the only begotten of the Father in the flesh, and the first to rise from the dead in the resurrection. Elder Bruce R. McConkie explained, Christ is the image of the Father physically and spiritually, in person and in personality. Physically, the resurrected Lord, who ate and drank with his disciples after he t- attained immortality, and whose body of flesh and bones they felt and handled is in the express image of his Father's person. They look alike in appearance. One could pass for the other. Spiritually, our Lord is in the form of God. He has acquired all of the attributes of godliness in their perfection. As it is with the Father, so it is with him. He is the embodiment of justice, mercy, and truth, of faith, hope, charity, wisdom, virtue, and knowledge, and of every good thing. Thus, he is in the likeness of and a projection of the personality of the Father. God is the Father. Christ is the Son in pre-existence. He is our elder brother, the first of the spirit children born to his exalted parent, I was in the beginning with the Father, he said, and I am the firstborn, Genesis 29, 93, 21. In that spirit sphere, he advanced and progressed until he became like unto God, Abraham 3, 24, in power and intelligence. And it was then that he was chosen and foreordained to be the Redeemer. When he, as a spirit being, appeared to the brother of Jared, he said, This body which you now behold is the body of my spirit. And even as I appear unto thee to be in spirit, will I appear unto my people in the flesh. End of quote of Mother Bukonki. D. Kelly Ogden and Andrew Skinner, two professors of BYU of Ancient Scripture, gave the following insights. Paul wrote that God's Son, Jesus Christ, is the image, Greek meaning icon, of the invisible, meaning unseen God, meaning the Father. The scriptures do teach anthropomorphism, not God in the image of man, but man in the image of God, just as Genesis 1.27 says. We have bodies, he has a body. The Bible notes that God has a face. He has eyes, ears, a mouth, arms, hands, fingers, a heart, and feet, and so forth. Paul constantly talks about the resurrection of Jesus Christ, emphasizing that he has a glorified body. Luke recorded his witness of the risen Lord. Handle me and see me, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. Luke 24, 39. The prophet Joseph Smith wrote, That which is without body, parts, and passions is nothing. There is no other God in heaven but that God who has flesh and bones. Continuing, Ogden and Andrew Skinner. Today, as in the days of Colossae, 
False ideas still abound regarding the nature of God. In A.D. 325, a council was held in Nicaea, which lies some 50 miles southeast of today's Istanbul, Turkey. More than 300 bishops gathered to decide whether or not the body of Christ was corporal, meaning physical, and whether or not the Son is the same person as the Father. Since that occasion, some wrong ideas have circulated and persisted among Christians. For example, a basic Lutheran creed consists of the following statement, quote, We unanimously hold and teach, in accordance with the decree of the Council of Nicaea, that there is one divine essence, which is called and which is truly God, and there are three persons in this one divine essence, equal in power and alike, eternal, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but that makes no sense or has no meaning whatsoever. Roman Catholicism, the Church of England, and the Methodist Church all subscribe to a similar ideological portrayal of God. There is but one living and true God everlasting without body or parts. And in the unity of this Godhead, there are three persons of one substance, power, and eternity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I could not worship a God that is described that way. That would be impossible for me to conceive of having faith in a God that really does not exist, but is an, is an essence. The Old and New Testament clearly presents the doctrine of the Godhead, the same doctrine as revealed through the prophets and apostles of the Church of Jesus Christ in our own day. We believe in God the Father and in His Son Jesus Christ and in the Holy Ghost, Article of Faith 1. These three constitute three distinct personages and three gods. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 370. The Father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the Son also. But the Holy Ghost has not a body of flesh and bones, but it is a personage of spirit. Doctrine and Covenants 130.22 Colossians 1, 16 through 17, through Jesus Christ were all things created. Jesus Christ is the creator, and he has governing power over all his creations. President Down H. Oates explained, under the direction and accordance to the plan of God the Father, Jesus Christ is the creator, the source of light and life of all things. Through modern revelation, we have the testimony of John, who bore record that Jesus Christ is the light and the redeemer of the world, the spirit of truth who came into the world because the world was made by him, and in him was the life of men and the light of men. The worlds were made by him, men were made by him. All things were made by him and through him and of him. Doctrine Covenants 93, 9 through 10. End of Elder Oaks quote. By Jesus Christ were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, meaning seen and unseen. Paul said that by Christ all things consist, meaning that Christ's power holds together all creations. I, isn't that amazing? What? A power. His power keeps everything together. Doctrine and Covenants 88, 6-13 gives more detail about how Jesus Christ governs all created things. Quoting DNC 88, verse 6, He Christ that ascended up on high, as also he descendeth below all things, and that he comprehend all things, that he might be in all and through all things the light of truth. Verse 7, which truth shineth, this is the light of Christ, as also he is in the Son, and the light of the Son, and the power thereby which it was made. Verse 8, as also he is in the moon, and is the light of the moon, and the power thereby which it was made. Verse 9, as also the light of the stars, and the power thereby which they were made. Verse 10, and the earth also, and the power thereof, even the earth upon which you stand. Verse 11, and the light which shineth, which giveth you light, is through him who enlightened your eyes, which is the same light that quickeneth your understanding. Verse 12, which light proceedeth forth from the presence of God to fill the immensity of space. 
And then last verse wrote 13, the light which is in all things, which giveth life to all things, which is the law by which all things are governed, even the power of God who sitteth upon his throne, who is in the bosom of eternity, who is in the midst of all things. Without the light of Christ, nothing would function. We would all die and everything would come to naught. Colossians 1.18, Christ is the head of the church. Paul's teaching that Jesus Christ stands at the head of the church are a reminder to people who would put angels or anyone or anything else ahead of him. At the time he was sustained as president of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saint, President Thomas S. Monson said, I testify that our Savior Jesus Christ is at the head of this church, he bit which bears his name. I know that the sweet experience in all this life is to fill his promptings as he directs us in the furtherance of his work. End of quote. Colossians 1.19, How does all fullness dwell in the Son? According to Paul, all fullness dwells in Jesus Christ. The, term, the Greek term for fullness suggests a totality of divine power. Paul therefore declared that Jesus Christ and his gospel are superior to all other philosophies and religions. God the Father vested in his beloved Son a fullness of power, both in heaven and in earth set him at his right hand, and made him perfect, even as he is perfect. Colossians 1, 20-25 Gospel preached to every creature. Verse 20, Reconcile or Reconciliation Through the atonement of Christ, coupled with obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel, men are reconciled to God and to Christ. Reconciliation comes by the shedding of Christ's blood and is bet between God in heaven and man on earth. Since all men are spiritually dead, Christ died for them all. Those who accept him are born again. They live again spiritually because of the ransoming power of his atonement. And having put on Christ, they no longer live for themselves alone. Once they lived carnalized, now they are new creatures of the Holy Ghost. Once they were children of disobedience, now they are the children of God. Consequently, they shall receive and inherit all things in eternity. Reconciliation is the process of ransoming man from his state of sin and spiritual darkness and restoring him to a state of harmony and unity with deity. Through it, God and man are no longer enemies. Man who was once carnal and evil, who lived after the manner of the flesh, becomes a new creature of the Holy Ghost. He is born again, and even as a little child, he is alive in Christ. Reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the flesh, or I'm sorry, to the will of the devil and the flesh, Jacob taught. And remember, after ye are reconciled unto God, that is only in and through the grace of God that ye are saved. 2 Nephi 10.24 Verse 21, Paul was saying, Even wicked men, though through repentance, are reconciled to God through Christ. Verse 22, Those who are reconciled become clean. They are pure, blameless. Their sins are forgiven. Verse 23, But the reconciliation remains in force only on the condition of continued obedience, which was preached to every creature which is under he heaven. What Paul probably wrote was that the gospel shall be preached to every creature which is under heaven. This is what we commonly say today to emphasize the importance of the gospel message and the universality of its application. However, two truths are known with reference to whom has and who will hear the gospel. One, every living soul did hear the gospel in pre-existence. That is fascinating. And number two, Every living soul shall hear the gospel again, either in this life or in the spirit world, before the day of resurrection of judgment. That is how and why Christ and God can be just. The gospel is the plan of salvation. It consists of the laws, ordinances, and eternal truths by conformity to which the spirit children of God can progress and advance until they become like the eternal parent. It is centered in Christ, whose atoning sacrifice guarantees immortality to all men and offers eternal life to all 
who obey its laws. The gospel was first revealed in the premortal life. It was known to all the spirit hosts of heaven in that day when Christ was chosen and foreordained to be redeemed. Those who then reject it were cast out with Lucifer and his angels. This same gospel was preached to Adam to all the saints of old. Christ restored it in the meridian of time. Paul and the ancient apostles preached it to the extent of their strength and abilities and has been restored again for the last time through Joseph Smith in this final dispensation. With its restoration has come the decree that it shall be preached in every nation among every people before the second coming of Christ. All men, however, will not hear it while in mortality. Rather, untold hosts will hear the message in the spirit world. For the eternal decree is that there is no eye that shall not see, neither the ear that shall not hear, neither the heart that shall not be penetrated. Doctrine and Covenants 1-2 Verse 24 I rejoice in the sufferings I endure for your sake and fill up the measure of afflictions Christ has still to endure in my flesh on behalf of his body, the church. In verse 25, Paul is a minister of the gospel sent to teach those truths dispensed to him by revelation. Colossians 1, 26-29, The mystery which hath been hid. Paul referred to the gospel of Jesus Christ as a mystery. Mysteries of God are spiritual truths known only by revelation. Christ's teachings are incomprehensible to the carnal mind. They cannot be understood by worldly power, only by revelation. Christ, <clears throat> uh, only by revelation from God. God reveals his mysteries to those who are obedient to the gospel. Therefore, Jesus Christ remains a mystery to all who are unbelieving and unrepentant. The truth of the gospel can be understood only through the Spirit. Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, verse 1. Paul, knowing of false teachings being preached, had great conflict concern for them. Paul, verse 2, Paul warned the saints to have their hearts knit together in love and the mystery of God, meaning having a witness from the Holy Ghost of the reality of the Father and the Son. The things about God that cannot, the things about God that cannot be learned by reason, but must be revealed such as that he is a personal being and that Christ is his Son, and to whose hands he has given all things. Men can reason that, because there is order in the universe, there must be some power which is called God. And, the soul, and, and though such a conclusion is true, it has no saving power. Salvation comes through that knowledge of God which comes by revelation, and which therefore remains forever a mystery to the carnal mind. Verse 3, And in the gift of revelation is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. This is one of the promises of the word of wisdom. DNC 89, 18 through 19, which says, And all saints remember to keep and do these sayings, walking in obedience to the commandments to receive health in their navel, navel and marrow to their bones, and shall find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures. This is the main reason for the word of wisdom, that by not partaking of substances, God reveals as improper that will keep the Holy Ghost from dwelling with us, will make our temple body fit to receive revelation. The Father and the Son have all wisdom and all knowledge, which can only be known by the Spirit through revelation. The word of wisdom as the health code is only a secondary effect. The main idea is to not take those substances that dulls the Spirit within us so that we cannot fill the Holy Ghost and receive revelation. That's its main purpose, not that it's just a health code. Verse 4 in Colossians 2. Paul emphasizes these truths about Christ, lest they should be guilty by false teachings and persuasion. Verse 5. While I am physically absent from you, I am with you in spirit, rejoicing with you, and beholding your order and the firm foundation of your faith in Christ. Colossians 2, 6-10. Philosophy, traditions, and rudiments of the world. In Colossians 2, 6-7, Paul used the imagery of a tree and a building to describe the stability, being rooted and grounded, that comes through faith in Jesus Christ, continuing his case that the Colossian saints should stay true to Jesus Christ. Paul encouraged the saints to continue in the faith 
grounded and settled and be not moved. Later in Colossians 2.8, Paul warned the saints to beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. In this verse, the word spoil refers to a conqueror taking a person captive in a war. Philosophy and vain deceit refers to any man-made system of belief and worship. According to Paul, because Jesus Christ is the head of all principality and power, adopting any belief or religious practices other than the true gospel will have eternal consequences. President Dieter F. Uchtdorf of the First Presidency contrasted the world's theories and philosophies with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, quote, The world is not bashful in offering numerous new answers to every problem we face. People run from one new idea to the next, hoping to find something that will answer the burning question of their souls. They attend seminars, buy books and other products. They get caught up in the excitement of looking for something new. But inevitably, the flame of each new theory fades, only to be replaced by another new and improved solution that prompts to do what the others before could not. It is not that these worldly options don't contain elements of truth. Many of them do. Nevertheless, they all for, fall short of the lasting change we seek in our lives. After the excitement wears off, the hollowness remains as we look for the next new idea to unlock the secrets of happiness. In contrast, the gospel of Jesus Christ has the answers to all of our problems. The gospel is not a secret. It is not complicated or hidden. It can unlock the door to true happiness. It is not someone's theory or proposition. It does not come from man at all. It springs from the pure and everlasting waters of the creator of the universe who knows truths we cannot even begin to comprehend. End of quote. Verse 9, the fullness of the Godhead. Perhaps no better statement defining the Godhead and showing the relationship of its members to each other has been written in this dispensation than that given by the prophet Joseph Smith in the lectures on faith. Quoting Joseph Smith, there are two personages who constitute the great matchless governing and supreme power over all things by whom all things were created and who constitute the great matchless governing and supreme power over all things by whom all things were created and made that are created and made, whether visible or invisible, whether in heaven, on earth, or in the earth, under the earth, or throughout the immensity of space. They are the Father and the Son, the Father being a personage of spirit meaning that he has a spiritual body, which by revealed definition is a resurrected body of flesh and bones, glory and power possessing all perfection and fullness. The Son, who was in the bosom of the Father, a personage of tabernacle, made or fashioned like unto man, or being in the form and likeness of man, or rather man was formed after his likeness and in his image, he is also the express image and likeness of the personage of the Father, possessing all the fullness of the Father, or the same fullness with the Father, being begotten of him, and ordained from before the foundation of the world to be a propitiation for the sins of all those who should believe on his name, and is called the Son because of the flesh, and descended in suffering below that which man can suffer, in other words, suffered greater sufferings and was exposed to be more powerful contradictions than any man can be. But notwithstanding all this, he kept the law and remained without sin, showing thereby that it is in the power of man to keep the law and remain also without sin, and also that by him a righteous judgment might come upon all flesh and that all who walk in the law of God may justly be commended by the law and have no excuse for their sins. And he, being the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and having overcome, received the fullness of the glory of the Father, possessing the same mind with the Father, which mind is the Holy Spirit that bears record of the Father and the Son. And these three are one, or in other words, these three constitute the great matchless governing and supreme power over all things, by whom all things were created and made that were created and made. And these three constitute the Godhead and are one, the Father and the Son, possessing the same mind, the same wisdom, glory, power, fullness, 
filling all in all, the Son being filled with the fullness of his mind, glory and power, or in other words, the spirit, glory, and power of the Father, possessing all knowledge and glory and the same kingdom, sitting at the right hand of power and in the express image and likeness of the Father, mediator for man, being filled with the fullness of the mind of the Father, or in other words, the Spirit of the Father, which Spirit is shed forth upon all who believe on his name and keep his commandments. And all those who keep his commandments shall grow up from grace to grace and become heirs of the heavenly kingdom and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, possessing the same mind, being transformed into the same image or likeness, even this express image of him who fills all in all, being filled with the fullness of his glory and become one in him, even as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. End of Joseph Smith's quote. Verse 10, ye are complete in him. Men receive all they need for salvation through Christ and his gospel. They need not add thereto the learning of the world, the philosophy of his men, or the so-called wisdom of the ages. Salvation is in Christ and his gospel. However beneficial it may be to be learned in the things of the world, still spiritual blessings come through revealed knowledge. The knowledge that saves is the knowledge of God. Colossians 2.11 circumcision of Christ, a spiritual circumcision which consists in accepting Christ and living his gospel of cutting away, not a part of the body, but one's whole carnal nature. The contrast is with carnal or literal circumcision, which had in times past been a symbol of conformity to the law of carnal commandments, which God gave Moses to remind Israel of her duties. If we will cut away all of our carnal nature, the natural man, and become a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord, and become as a child submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord sees fit to inflict upon him, even as a child just submit to his father, we can then become born again in Christ. Colossians 2, 12-13, the symbolism of baptism by immersion. Brothers and sisters, the symbolism is not that the water washes sin away. Let's knock it off and get this right in the church. What sin does a sinless eight-year-old have? None. That is not the symbolism. Paul reminded members of the church that they had been baptized unto Jesus Christ, thus entering into a covenant relationship with Christ. For church members to choose to continue in sin was incompatible with that covenant relationship. Further, Paul taught that baptism symbolized being buried with Christ and becoming dead unto sin, being alive unto God. Baptism is a rebirth symbolizing, symbolized by coming up out of the waters of baptism. Just as we were born into the world and became a living soul, so we must be born again and become a member of God's kingdom. Both births involve the common elements of water, blood, and spirit. Baptism is a symbol of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We bury the old man, and we become resurrected as a new man, born again of Christ. That's the symbol of baptism. Colossians 2, 13 through 15, nailing it to, the cro to his cross. Prior to these verses in Colossians 2, Paul reminded the saints in Colossia that God had given them, had forgiven them, the imagery that Paul used in Colossians 2, 14-15 emphasized how Christ's atonement made it possible for our sins to be forgiven. In Paul's day, it was cost customary for Romans to write on a placard the crimes committed by a condemned person. When the wrongdoer was crucified, the placard was also nailed to the cross for all Paul's passerbyers to see. Paul used this imagery in verses 13 and 15 to teach the Colossians that they had been forgiven. It was as though a list of all the spiritual charges and accusations against the Colossian saints, including their sins and infractions against the ordinances of the law of Moses, were placed on a placard and nailed to the cross. Through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, these were erased or blotted out. Through the atonement of, and resurrection, Jesus Christ triumphed over all earthly powers and authorities. 
Colossians 2, 16 to 17. Verse 16, don't judge others by the Mosaic law. In other words, avoid legalism. Sabbath days are the seventh day. Accordingly, do not be misled by following the rituals and restrictions of the Mosaic law. Verse 17, these performances were only a type and a shadow of Christ and his gospel. And we now have the substance itself rather than the shadow, meaning the law of Moses was point to Christ and the atonement. That's already happened, so we don't need it anymore. Mosiah 13, 27-21 says, And now ye have said that salvation come by the law of Moses. I say unto you that it is expedient that you should keep the law of Moses as yet. But I say unto you that the time shall come when it shall no more be expedient to keep the law of Moses. And moreover, I say unto you that salvation doth not come by the, by the law alone. And were it not for the atonement which God himself shall make for the sins and iniquities of his people, that they must unavoidably perish, notwithstanding the law of Moses. And now I say unto you that it was expedient that there should be a law given to the children of Israel, even a very strict law, for they were a stiff-necked people, quick to do iniquity, and slow to remember the Lord their God. Therefore there was a law given them, yea, a law of performances and of ordinances, a law which they were to observe strictly from day to day, to keep them in remembrance of God and their duty towards him. But behold, I say unto you that all these things were types of things to come. Colossians 2, 18-19, Worshiping of Angels. Paul warned the Colossian saints not to be deceived by those who promoted the worship of angels. Although angels hold a position of honor in God's kingdom, they are not to be worshipped. The worship of angels is evidence that some teachings of Gnosticism were making their way into the church. Since Gnostic philosophy held that God communicated with mortals through angels and that the physical body was evil, Paul denounced this false religious system. A particular philosophy that was gaining popularity at the time was docetism, and I hope I'm saying that right. Docetism was part of a larger movement known as Gnosticism. A core teaching in many forms of Gnosticism was that the spirit was wholly good and that matter, including the physical body, was wholly evil. Followers of Gnosticism believed that salvation was not achieved by being freed from sin, but rather by freeing the spirit from matter, meaning the physical body. They also believed that salvation was achieved through special knowledge, gnosis, rather than through faith in Jesus Christ. Followers of Dogmatism overemphasized Jesus' spiritual nature to the point that they rejected the idea that he came to earth in an actual, in actual bodily form. They believed that God was invisible, immortal, all-knowing, and immaterial, and they considered the physical world and the physical body to be base and evil. Therefore, they believed that since Jesus was the divine Son of God, he could not have experienced the limitations of being human. In their view, Jesus Christ was not literally born in the flesh, and he did not inhabit a tangible body, bleed, suffer, die, or rise with a physical resurrected body. He only seemed to do those things. Doctism comes from the Greek dokio, meaning to seem or to appear. Again, boy, how could you have faith in anything of that, of such nonsense? Colossians 2, 20-23, will worship. Paul asked the saints why some of them were practicing in worldly ordinances and following doctrines of men, even though they had accepted Christ. He referred to such doctrines of men as will worship, which referred to man-made worship, religious rules and practices devised by the will or mind of man. One form of will worship that Paul mentioned was the neglecting the body, which referred to the practice of asceticism. People who practice asceticism abstain completely from physical pleasures and any effort to overcome desires of the flesh. They often adopted extreme dietary restrictions and renounced sexual relations even within the bonds of marriage. Such excessive practices are not in harmony with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Joel Smith translation helps clarify the meaning of Colossians 2, 21-22. It says, Why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances which are after the doctrines and the commandments of men, 
who teach you to touch not, taste not, handle not, all those things which are to perish with the using, which things have indeed a shadow of wisdom in will worship and humility and neglecting the body as to the satisfying the flesh, not in any honor to God. Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 2. Seek those things which are above. Having refuted false teachings in Colossians 2, Paul next exhorted his readers to set their affections on things above, not on things of the earth. Elder Joseph B. Wurzland similarly counseled Latter-day Saints to avoid becoming so busy with things of the world they lose their focus on eternal priorities. Quote, we can spend a lifetime whirling about at a feverish pace, checking off list after list of things that in the end really don't matter. That we do a lot may not be so important that we focus the energy of our minds, our hearts, and our souls on those things of eternal significance. That is essential. As the clatter and clamor of life bustle about us, we hear shouting to come here and to go there in the midst of the noise and seductive voices that compete for our time and interest. A solitary figure stands on the shores of the Sea of Galilee calling quietly to us, follow me. End of quote. Colossians 3 1, Christ sitting on the right hand of God. They are two exalted, perfected, and glorified men. Colossians 3 3 through 12, the new life hid with Christ in God. Paul taught, Ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Though the saints were not physically dead, Paul wanted them to understand that their former sinful selves had passed away as they put off the old man, and that they were to live a new life in Christ. Paul said that this new life was hid with Christ in God, suggesting that the life of a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ is secure in the Savior's care in both an earthly and eternal sense. Such faithful saints will appear with Jesus Christ in glory at his second coming. Paul further counseled church members, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, meaning they should deaden, get rid of, and control the desires and motives that belong to their earthly nature. On the most basic level, control anger, sexual drives, and dishonesty. Beyond basic control, develop real love or charity. Colossians 3, 5, inordinate affection referred to sexual immortality and evil con. Con 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 concupiscence refers to lustful sexual desires. Concupiscence. Boy, I'm not saying that right. An experience from the life of the prophet Joseph Smith illustrates the meaning of the phrase, your life is hid with Christ and God. On one occasion, Joseph Smith put his hand on the knee of his friend, William Clayton, and said, Your life is hid with Christ and God, and so are many others. Nothing but the unpardonable sin can prevent you from inheriting eternal life, for you are sealed up by the power of the priesthood until eternal life. For you are sealed up by the power of the priesthood and eternal life, having taken the steps necessary for that purpose. You have your life hid up with Christ in God is to have your calling and election made sure. Verse, chapter 3, verse 6, the wrath of God, the anger and indignant outpouring of divine justice upon the wicked, the meeting out of just punishment to those who rebel against God and his law, laws. Verse 8, blasphemy. Blasphemy consists neither or both of the following, one speaking irreverently, evilly, ab abusively, or scurriously against God or sacred things, or two, speaking profanely or falsely about deity. Among a great host of impious and sacrilegious speaking that constitute blasphemy are such things as taking the name of the God in vain, speaking evil speaking about the Lord's anointed, belittle, belittling sacred temple ordinances or patriarchal blessings or sacramental administrations, claiming unwarranted divine authority and pro promulgating with profane piety a false system of salvation. Verse 10, the new man, the saint of God, the man of righteousness, whose life is now patterned after Christ. 
Verse 11, barbarians and Scythians. Paul taught that Christ's atonement made all people equal, including Greeks, Jews, barbarians, and Scythians. Barbarians were any group of people whom the Romans saw as lacking civilian culture, and the Scythians were people from the north coast, northern coast of the Black Sea in modern-day Ukraine, whom Greeks viewed as being violent and uneducated. Colossians 3:12 through 17 put on bowels of mercy. Paul's counsel to be filled with kindness, forgiveness, mercy, and charity towards others was written while he was imprisoned. While in Liberty Jail, the prophet Joseph Smith wrote similar counsel to the saints, declaring, Let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men. This is a timeless counsel for the Lord's servants who are imprisoned unjustly, as well as for their followers. In just undeserved circumstances, bitterness must be removed from disciples and soul, souls so that the Spirit of the Lord can have influence in their lives. Verse 12, the elect of God. Those four ordained persons who believe in Christ, accept his gospel, gain the blessings of the temple, and therefore continue to walk in the paths of truth and righteousness. Verse 13, forgive one another. You ought to forgive one another, for he that forgiveth not his brother his trespass stand condemned before the Lord, for there remaineth in him the greater sin. I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, but of you it is to require to forgive all men. The reason why the, we had the greater sin is with us who won't forgive is if you won't forgive something, you're basically telling Jesus Christ that you do, do not trust him. You do not believe in his justice. You do not believe in his divine power and that he will take care of things. And so you are denying the divinity of Jesus Christ. That's why it's a greater sin. Verse 14, put on charity. Doctrine Covenants 88, 125 states, And above all things, clothe yourselves with the bonds of charity, as with a mantle, which is the bond of perfectness and peace. 315, God's peace, which can only come from righteous obedience to God, and putteth off the natural man, and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord, and becometh as a child, submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to inflict upon him, even as a child does submit to his father, and our guilt was swept away. Should rule in our hearts, and to be thankful. Dr. Cummins 78 19 says, And he who receiveth all things with thankfulness shall be made glorious, and the things of this earth shall be added unto him, even a hundredfold, yea, more. 316, let the word of Christ dwell in you, meaning feast upon the words of Christ. Let the darknesses of salvation sink into your soul. Wherefore I said unto you, feast upon the words of Christ. Behold, the words of Christ will tell you all things that you should do. Wherefore, now after I have spoken these words, if you cannot understand them, it will be because you ask not, neither do you knock. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light. But you must perish in the dark. For behold, again I say unto you, that if ye will enter in by the way and receive the Holy Ghost, it will show unto you all things what ye should do. Second Nephi 32, 3 through 5. Chapter 3, verse 17. Any word which cannot be spoken in the name of Christ should be left unsaid. Any deed that cannot properly bear our Lord's name should be left undone. Colossians 3, 18 through 21, a household code. Colossians 3, 18 through chapter 4, 1, composed what some call a household code, consisting of principles and rules for marriage, various members of a household. Rather than espouse the common culture household expect expectations of his day, Paul admonished the saints to evaluate their household and relationships according to the Lord's standards sees such phases as in the Lord or unto the Lord, thus bringing greater unity and peace to Christian families and congregations alike. Colossians 3, 18-19, Counsel to Spouses. At the heart of Paul's counsel to households is the idea that loving relationships should exist between husband and wives. Regarding such relationships, President Spencer W. Kimball taught, the spouse should be preeminent in the life of the husband or wife. And neither social life, nor occupational life, nor political life, nor any other interest, nor person, nor thing, shall ever take precedence over the companion 
spouse. Marriage presupposes total allegiance and total fidelity. Each spouse takes the, takes the partner with the understanding that he or she gives self-totality to the spouse, all the heart, strength, loyalty, honor, and affection with all dignity. Any, any divergence is sin. Any sharing the heart is transgression. As we should have an eye single to the glory of God, so should we have an eye, an ear, a heart single to the marriage and spouse and family. End of quote. Colossians 3, 22 through 25, the case of slaves have treated more fully since the case of one Simonus was engaging Paul's attention, but he wished to keep the gospel clear of any attempts to revolutionize society. It was to be leaven, not dynamic. Eye service, that is, service most zealously performed when the slave is under observation. Verses 23 through 24, Paul is saying these servants were slaves. The social structure which kept them in bondage was outside the power of the Ephesian saints to change or overthrow. Paul thus has no alternative but to recognize their state and counsel them how to live under it. Labor, laboring honestly and diligently as to the Lord, service rendered others should be performed as though for the Lord. Verse 25, the meaning is probably that Christian slaves must not suppose because he is a Christian that God will deal leniently with his misconduct. See, even today, God has to work within different cultures in different countries. The church is not strong enough to overthrow governments and cultures and things. It has to work within that and try to help people to overcome the bad cultures and things that are going on in society. Colossians chapter 4, saints exhorted to be wise in all things. Colossians 4, 3, to speak the mystery of Christ. Paul was seeking the prayer of the saints so that he could teach effectively the mystery of Christ. Coming to a knowledge and witness of the reality of the Savior can only come by revelation, which is a mystery to the carnal or natural man. Colossians 4, 5, walk in wisdom. Church members have a special obligation to conduct themselves in such a way that others seeing their good works will be led to accept the gospel. When Coriantum, for instance, consorted with an harlot, the Zoramite seeing his conduct would not believe the gospel teachings of his father Alma. Colossians 4, 6, let speech be seasoned with salt, Paul was meaning. Paul recommended that saints walk in wisdom towards them that are without. The phrase, them that are without, referred to people who are not members of the church. Paul then said, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt. In ancient times, salt was used in the offering of temple offerings and thus became a symbol of gospel covenants. Salt was also used as a purifying agent. Therefore, Paul's teaching about speech being seasoned with salt reminded church members that all their communication, even with non-Christians, should be pure in harmony and with the covenant they had made with the Lord. 416. Some claim that the Bible as presently constituted is, is complete word of God and that we should not consider receiving any more revelation. Galatians 4, 10, and 16, on the other hand, indicate that some epistles written by Paul are now missing. Therefore, scholars ask, is the canon of Scripture full? Do we now have all the inspired words of the prophets and apostles have ever written? As Nephi testified, this is from 2 Nephi 29, 3-10, And because of my words shall his forth many of the Gentiles shall say, A Bible, a Bible, we have got a Bible. And there cannot be any more Bible, but thus saith the Lord God, O fools, they shall have a Bible, and it shall proceed forth from the Jews, my ancient covenant people. And what thank they the Jews for the Bible which they received from them? Yea, what do the Gentiles mean? Do they remember the travails and labors and pains of the Jews, and their diligence unto me in bringing forth the salvation unto the Gentiles? O ye Gentiles, have you remembered the Jews, my ancient covenant people? Nay, but ye have cursed them, and you have hated them, and have not sought to recover them. But behold, I will return all these things upon your own heads. For I, the Lord, have not forgotten my people. Thou fool, thou shalt say a Bible. We have got a Bible, and we need no more Bible. Have you obtained a Bible, save it were by the Jews? 
Know ye not that there are more nations than one? Know ye not that I, the Lord God, have created all men, and that I remember those who are upon the isles of the sea, and that I rule in the heavens above and in the earth beneath, and I bring forth my word unto the children of men, yea, even upon all the nations of the earth? Wherefore murmur ye, because ye shall receive more of my word. Know ye not that the testimony of two nations is a witness unto you that I am God, that I remember one nation like unto another? Wherefore I speak the same words unto one nation like unto another. And when the two nations shall run together, the testimony of the two nations shall run together also. And I do this, that I may prove unto many that I am the same yesterday, today, and forever." and that I speak forth my words according to mine own pleasure. And because that I have spoken one word, need not suppose that I cannot speak another. For my work is not yet finished, neither shall it be until the end of man, neither from that time forth, henceforth, and forever. Wherefore, because that ye have a Bible, ye need not suppose that it contains all my words, neither need ye suppose that I have not caused more to be written." How foolish and arrogant it is of mankind that to, to say that God cannot give any more revelation. We are so much arrogant people here on earth. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for watching. May we take God's words with full purpose of heart and realize that he will even give us more words and that he will probably give us more scripture in days to come. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button.